Welcome. Do you want to play it easy? Or the... Glib remark? No more foreplay.
Hey guys, sorry, we're figuring out the audio situation right now. Can you let us know if you hear something? Can you guys hear me now? Testing. Yeah. Yep. I'm just gonna see the chat if uh, anyone can hear. Very faint. Okay, let me slide this all the way up. <laughs> Sorry about guys. All good. Finally, please go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss any of our future workshops or content curated for the movie lovers. We promise you won't regret it. Anyway, on to today's workshop. For 50 years, Dan Perry's work has been inseparable from the lexicon of film pop culture. From comedies like Caddyshack to historical crime epics like Gangs in New York, he has put a stamp on shaping many generations of moviegoers. His book, which you can now buy on his website, danperry.com, chronicles his life's work filled with antidotes, insights, and from behind, from behind the scenes, and elements rarely seen from the cutting room floor. We're honored to talk about this tonight. Welcome, Dan Perry. Dan, how are you doing? Doing well here, Mark. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And oh, very happy. To I be can't here. think of a I can't think of a more deserving person to to talk to about it. Thank you very much. I've been looking forward to this, and I'm happy to share my thoughts and my work and answer questions and illuminate the work and the experience. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Dan, how would you uh, how would you describe the work of a title designer? I'm trying to get everyone on the chat to kind of get a sense of what exactly you do. So, do you want to give us like maybe like a brief, uh, yeah, just a brief kind of thing of what your work entails? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, in the commercial world of filmmaking, <clears throat> which is where I work exclusively, um, films that are released by various studios around the country and around the world. Uh, um, have requirements for the films that based upon contracts they have with the filmmakers. And this uh, extends to all the technical aspects of not sure the actors and producers and filmmakers. So their names by agreement have to be on the film. Those are called titles. And uh, long ago, if, for anyone who watches older films, uh, there's been attempts to design titles for many, many decades 
uh, all corresponding with and, and uh, complying with the agreements that existed on each of those films. So it becomes my job to put the titles on the film so they can be read. They're giving credit to all those who have agreed uh, to get, be given credit to. Uh, but they can be designed so that there's integrity and artistry to them while you're presenting the information that has to be there for legal reasons. And that's where I come in, um, creating a way to integrate the titles with the film and with special backgrounds or shots that the director has shot to uh, introduce the characters or follow them from one character place to another. All those things uh, I work with and sometimes create uh, in total and then apply the titles to them to um, deliver the necessary requirements for that film. Amazing. And Dan, of course, we're here to talk about your book, your incredible book uh, on your life's work. And I thought uh, we were talking about it earlier before the uh, call started. Uh, I'd be curious to see uh, or curious to hear your thoughts of why uh, you decided to write your book. What came up with it? What was your uh, your your general thoughts and and, uh, and some of the stuff that went into it over the course of uh, of essentially uh, uh, assembling your life's work into a particular uh, piece? Right. Uh, for a number of years now, I've been speaking to schools and festivals and museums and so on about my work. I put together a program of my title work that I present and, and run pieces of it and answer questions and talk about it and describe the work. And um, the purpose of that was to share. For me, it's about sharing what I know and what I've done. And so, uh, therefore, it's generally directed toward a student audience, but there's many, many people who follow my work and who like my work who aren't students at all, uh, but I want to reach them too and share the work with them. So uh, writing a book about it all was yet another way that I could share that work. Uh, I've been encouraged to do it for a number of years from friends of mine who thought that it'd be interesting to see all the work together in one place and then read what I've, what I've said about it why I did what I did for, on certain films and along the way experiences I had with different filmmakers and other characters <laughs> in the <laughs> business. So it's been now um, more than a sec half a century of time that I've been here in Los Angeles and partly in New York years ago uh, just designing titles uh, for one film and another, um, some of which was for television, but a large majority of these for feature films. And um, I'm still working, still getting calls, I'm still being sought to uh, put my title designs on their new films. And it's been fun, it's been great, quite a ride, uh, but I'm still enjoying it, still doing it, and finally I'm still able to come up with new ideas and ways to apply those titles. Amazing. Yeah, if uh, I know everyone can't really see it in person, or for those that might have it already, um, the book itself is uh, is just incredible. It's a beautiful piece of work, and uh, Dan, I was I'm curious, uh, how long did it take to assemble the book? Uh, it was it a course of a year, or was it the course of a couple of years? Uh, what what was the start to finish process like? Well, altogether, it was a couple of years. Uh, at first, I, as I thought about, this is a good idea to write it all down. And so I began the process of recalling things and remembering things that happened back years ago. I, I went even as far back as to my childhood, where I first started buying and painting and sketching. And then I was doing cartooning, caricature work. And um, then I started sign painting, but all of that came back to me. And uh, I saw that I could assemble something that made sense and that covered enough of my life and my work that uh, hopefully people would be interested in reading about it. So once I had it mostly written, 
um, then I was interviewing different publishers who were interested in publishing the book because it, it would be costly to do it right, do it as a um, coffee table book rather than a uh, per perfect bound or some paper uh, binding kind of thing, which I didn't want. And when um, these publishers who were interested wanted to cheapen it in order to sell more of them because they saw there could be a large audience for it, uh, I couldn't have that, so I decided to publish it myself. So over the year that when the pandemic first began, last spring, I began designing it and creating the artwork for it. And then a, a printer fell into place, and I then provided the proper artwork and the technical aspects of it to them. And then it was printed over uh, the end of last year, and I took delivery on a thousand books uh, late January. And along the way, a good friends of mine in Toronto, in fact, were helping me to, and they created a website for me. And uh, since then, we've been posting things about the book, about me, about the work, and so on. Since then, and uh, there's been an enormously comp complex and, and uh, a very uh, positive response to the book. Well, uh, I'm not surprised by the positive response. It is absolutely beautiful. All right, Dan, do you want to tell us about? Uh, uh, there's one effect that you uh, that you were talking to me about earlier, um, the spot varnish of the film reels. Where was that? Where did that idea come from? And and was that always the the case from the beginning, or did you want to uh, uh, did you want to implement that? Like, is that uh, later on in the process? Well, uh, I wanted to represent film in a, its pure state. Uh, oftentimes, you see uh, film strips and different uses of uh, the film element uh, in books and other places, and they don't get it right. It's distorted, there's, there's too many holes in the, uh, along the side of the film, or not enough, or, or too big. Or, I want it to be pure, as if it's real film. Now, certainly, I couldn't make it the size of 35 millimeter film, because it'd be too small. You couldn't see the images well enough. Uh, so I made it as large as I could, to fill the page and, and leave some space to write things about it as well. And so in order for it to feel as real as possible, it had to have the same glossy, shiny surface that real film has. And then I went as far as having my lab shoot uh, all the logos that I've designed that are in the book onto single frames of 35 millimeter film. Then uh, I cut them up into strips and provide them along with the book uh, as an option for the buyer, uh, which is uh, the purest form because it's actual real film. Mm -hmm. And there's a page, I think it's page five, where the film strips appear in the book and they're spot borders, so they look exactly like real pieces of film. And you can take the, the pieces of film that come with the book and lay it right over it and see if it's exactly the same size. Amazing. And along with it, 70 millimeter film business card, which is also printed on the page and spot varnish, so it's glossy the way the actual film is. And then you get a, a sample of the business card along with the film strips uh, as an option with the book. So it's, uh, it's pure and accurate and real. And that's what my goal was. And I always wanted to spot varnish. And while I worked with the printers, I found that it was affordable an additional cost, certainly, uh, than just printing it, but uh, a necessary cost in my mind. It just had to be uh, spot varnished to, uh, to bring out the reality, uh, the accuracy. And That's incredible. Yeah, we've got a... Uh Dan, we've already got questions rolling in for you. Um, I know we're going to be discussing four specific titles um, that you had sent over for us, and we'll get into those in a bit, but I think it's kind of relevant for a couple of these are more talking about the process, which is kind of what we're talking about right now, which is great. Um, uh, we have uh, a couple of people from YouTube have already uh, submitted questions. Uh, Finn uh, has uh, asked a question that he wants to know your process like in terms of creatively. How does, you know, you go from watching the movie to being able to incorporate the movie's essence into the title? Right. Well, uh, 
for me, it's a really simple process in that uh, obviously watching the film is the necessary first step. Um, many times I read scripts uh, and get an idea of the story and so on, but then I'm interpreting the film as a filmmaker. Uh, by reading the script, I'm imagining how the story could be told. But that's probably far away from the way the director of the film has interpreted it. So it's of no value to read the script for me. I have to see the film. So once I've seen the film, and whatever form it's in, whatever stage of the editing it is, I can get a sense of how the story's being told and what it's about and so on. So then after seeing the film, I simply sit and think about it. And fortunately, ideas always come to me as to how to handle the logo and the name of the film and the subsequent other titles that go with it. Uh, so it, it's a matter for me of the simplicity of listening to myself. And uh, things come to mind. I see them in my mind's eye. And then it's this frantic uh, process of scurrying to find a piece of paper. And I always use a pencil with an eraser on the back of it so I can change it. But I have to scribble down this idea before <laughs> it evaporates, before it goes away. And sometimes mm -hmm. that happens and I can't remember it again or I have to watch the film again or do something to stimulate that idea to come back. Uh, and fortunately, once again, a lot of ideas come to me. So it's this mad dash to pull them all down in a way so that I can uh, remember what I've thought of and then put it down and, and work with it and manipulate it and start to refine it so it makes sense and then I can ultimately show it to the filmmaker. As oh, amazing. Uh, uh, so I, I guess this kind of relates to that, Dan, in terms of like when you have that idea and you have that idea on the top of your head that you have to jot down, um, one of the other questions we've gotten in is, um, do you hand draw on those titles first right. or do you do everything digitally? So I guess this would be, I guess, which one did you, which one do you prefer to do? I always draw them in pencil at first. And since I know hundreds of type styles, I'll imagine the logo being in a particular type style, let's say. And then I'll scribble it down and I'll start to alter it and embellish it and make more of it than just a line of type. Um, and then I could use that type style later for the remainder of the titles, if it's drawn from an existing type style. But more often than not, um, uh, create something that, though it might be related to an existing type style, it, ha it has characteristics of it that I brought to it from my imagining and from my reaction to the film. So that letters uh, are shaped differently, or they're embellished, or, for example, right behind me there, uh, Suspiria. The logo has different size letters, different colors, and they're arranged proportionally and there there's spaces that are irregular and so on uh, all that come came out of seeing the film and just my own instinctive um, organic reaction to it so that's how it happens now is it have you noticed as the years have gone on dan that you have adapted to different forms of uh, I guess, like, once you transfer from pencil to get to a different form of technology, do you, do, you, do you prefer that? Do you find it more difficult now, or do you find it easier on certain things, uh, especially when trying to, um, I guess, adapt to a digital technology that seems to be, like, you know, happening now versus, say, 40 years ago? Yes. Uh, for most of my career, I worked uh, in the optical world and shot things on the film and then delivered the product uh, on as well. Then when digital came along, um, I saw that as they developed it, at first it was, uh, it was not very uh, responsive to the things that could be done optically, but very quickly uh, they designed and with software and programs that could do not only what you could do with film, but more. And uh, I was very excited to see that. And, quickly learned how to interpret that, that uh, process 
uh, in, into my work so uh, I could do it quicker and easier. And very importantly, I could preserve an idea that uh, inspired another idea. Whereas if you shoot something on film and then you edit it together, for example, uh, as you're developing it, and then you want to change it, you have to take it apart and assemble it again, then the first one's gone. Well, it's, it's now been taken apart and it exists as a new version. Whereas digitally, you can shoot something, put it together digitally, and then put that aside and do something else, and you have all these versions that you can refer back to. So uh, that's an important part of solving the problem, is uh, comparing and uh, bouncing off of and improving and changing what you've done pr previously. Um, so I like the digital process a lot. And... Um, but it's only another tool. You have to know what it can do so that you, the things you might imagine uh, are able to be executed in the process. Uh, but it's only a tool. And mm -hmm. knowing your tools is the secret to doing things. Uh, that what do you find, Dan, that keeps that creati creativity, creativity going over the course of... Um, Many years. What what inspires you about different projects like say come up um, that allows you to you know do something different you know expand on you know something you've done in the past or 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 maybe adapt an idea that you didn't know about from before and and want to do uh, it may apply to a new property. Right. Well, um, I, I'm not really conscious of that. I don't mean to say that I'm unconscious, but I mean to say that I'm not aware. That of what I've done in the past as it, as it applies to a new project and a new idea. I mean, I might think of something and I was, no, that I did that three years ago. No, but that doesn't happen. Uh, because each film is different and unique and special. Um, the solution for the titles is d different and unique as well. So I don't, I don't think it's like any other film that I've done or anyone else has done. Um, so there is always something new that I can bring to it because the film is inspiring me to bring something new to it. Uh, and it's, it's always exciting and fun and new and refreshing and the, the variety is endless. So I've never had a problem in uh, approaching a film and finding something special and unique about it to apply to the titles. Um, once years ago, um, the director called me and said he loved what I did on Taxi Driver and he wanted me to do exactly that on his film. And I hadn't seen the film, but even without seeing it, I said, well, your film is, I'm sure, different than Taxi Driver, so why would you want something that was done for another film? I said, uh, you really don't need me. You just need someone who can execute your idea or duplicate Taxi Driver. So um, I didn't wind up doing that film, and I don't even know what he wound up doing with it. But um, I, I couldn't do that. I knew it would be <laughs> the wrong solution for his film. And I'd be then duplicating myself as well. There, there was just no, no sense to it at all. Oh, that's that. Uh, it's interesting, you know, hearing different creatives and how, you know, you approach, you know, different, vi you know, different titles. Um, we today we're going to look at uh, a multitude of different titles that you have like given to us, and we're going to uh, some of the ones that you know we are working looking at are Star Wars, Nashville, The Exorcist, and uh, and the last one's blanking on me. <laughs> <laughs> and taxi driver. That's it. Thank you, Dan. I have. That's what you're here for. You're here to help me uh, to do my job. Really, that's what exactly it is. So yes, but um, uh, I think we should. What we'll probably do is we're gonna uh, we're gonna show the clip of Star Wars. We're gonna start with that, uh, and then um, as Dan, you'll be able to see it on our screen here, and then we'll go through it. Um, if there's anything in particular, and people can uh, ask questions about it, I know I know I sure have questions because uh, I certainly. Uh, uh, is seems to be my favorite particular franchise and movie. So um, it's a it's an incredible uh, pleasure to be able to talk to you about this. So um, I'm curious uh, if you could just give a background. How exactly did uh, the meeting come up to start on this project? 
uh, it came up from a friend of mine who was supervising the post-production on the film, who I knew for many years and had worked with in various ways before. <clears throat> and uh, he called and said that George Lucas was doing this film and he was interested in my doing the titles for it. So I subsequently met with George and um, was hired to engage to create the titles. Um, then he wanted me to look at all these different uh, old um, serials and adventure films from the 30s and 40s of Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon and things like that. So I looked at mm -hmm. lots, and lots of old films and um, along the way, I came upon this film from 1939, an American film from Cecil, Cecil B. DeMille called Union Pacific, which was about the railroad and the building of the railroad in the U.S. And the first shot of the film was looking down these empty tracks, railroad tracks, and then from below the camera, the titles rolled down the tracks. So I envisioned that in space and imagine that the logo would come on and then it would pull the titles behind it down these invisible tracks into deep space. So I presented that idea to George and um, he finally liked it because most of the things I'd not shown him, he didn't like much. So he gave me the green light to go ahead and, and create it. And then uh, months of work was ahead of me to uh, design it and put it together on film as I had envisioned it. Um, so there was this endless testing of uh, the type style and how big should it be, what color would it be in, how would the words be arranged on the preamble, uh, how many lines would there be, uh, how wide would it be, how, what angle would it be tilted at to travel back in space, what, where would the horizon line be, uh, how fast would it go? Uh, there are all these endless little subtleties that separately don't amount to much, but collectively make all the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, I solved each problem as I went, and others came up that I didn't expect along the way, but finally got it into a condition that I could show it to George um, and White and uh, off of shooting tests and uh, for the all different things I mentioned. Finally, he gave me the approval to put it together. And then he gave me the Star Wars background, the, or the Star Field background, which I superimposed this over. And uh, finally, it was after shooting it uh, half a dozen times on color stock and tweaking it along the way, and we finally had it done. And it wasn't long before the release date, so it was very tight. And I didn't have the music to work to, which I often do, and I can do a better job by working against the music and coordinating with the music. But uh, that didn't happen on Star Wars. But how, how, how tight was that deadline, Dan? Well, the, the film was released on May 25th, and I think I delivered it sometime in uh, mid-April. So it was no more than a few weeks. And they had to cut negative and make prints and you know, time everything and color correct and, and then make enough prints to be distributed all over the country. It was first released in the US only, I believe. And it wasn't a real big release. Uh, a big release now is like 5,000 copies. Mm -hmm. And then a big release, 1,500 copies. And I don't think Star Wars was receiving that big. But they had to make all those prints and distribute them and ship them physically to the different theaters all over the country. So it was very tight. And there was, what was no the, uh, Dan, right there. <laughs> what was the, uh, you had mentioned that there were like certain things that came up in the creative process of it. Um, things you were testing out, like the angle of it and, uh, you know, how it like looked in, in the space that you would put it in. I'm curious, what were, what was the, uh, I guess the unseen problems that are unseen creative in creating that title design, uh, what, what it's so specific to what it is. It's not, has been done really. Now, if you think about it, it's it, that particular title design is specific to star Wars. So, uh, 
I'm curious what you know what what problems came up during the design process to you know, to really uh, yeah to really like set it aside or set what things were different essentially. Well, the most important problem was uh, readability. And I mean that um, TypeStop was very simple and very readable. And the arrangement of the lines of the number of words per line so that you could read it easily and follow it. And the number of lines to deliver the entire message was worked out. Um, but as I shot it at the angle that we finally determined would be the best for it to travel at the certain angles so that the horizon line was above center, but not too high or too low. Um, as it traveled back in space, you couldn't read it long enough for those who read slower than others uh, because the lines were obliterated. The, the, like the first line was, was soon obliterated by the second line and the second line obliterated by the third line and so on. So it limited the amount of time you had to read all the words. So I started proportionally spacing the lines. So I had to take all the artwork apart and move the second line a little bit further away from the first line and move the third line a little, little more away from the second line than the second from the first and so on so that at the correct angle it read for a longer period of time before it caught up with itself and started to obliterate the readability. So it gave mm -hmm. you, I don't know, five or six or eight seconds more of reading time than it was originally. And certainly for me, things have to be readable. Um, I see designs that uh, are so close to being unreadable that it's it's a crime to not give those people's names and the information uh, it's due uh, time to be read. So I had to make it readable as long as possible. And, it could, and by that time, we couldn't change the length of time that it took for it to travel all the way through because they were now doing sound effects and music to it. So I had to live with that and therefore find a solution within the constraints that I had designed. It. <laughs> you, see, you set yourself up <laughs> into yeah. your own, in your okay. own design. <laughs> a problem that you have to solve in order to make that design effective and successful. Um, the story about Raging Bull, I can tell at the time perhaps that uh, that happened uh, specifically because of the idea <laughs> uh, with um, with the title Dan it's also interesting because um, the copy itself in it was uh, it, it's very specific in, in that it's not very long so you have to say uh, you know essentially set up the movie while also achieving your design make it readable and then finally you know have the audience understand what's going on when the movie starts uh, did you always have um, that length of copy, or did that change uh, depending on as the design process went on? Boy, the best I can remember, uh, it might have changed a few words here and there. But I think by the time um, Lucas gave me the copy that he wanted on the film, he had pretty much worked out all the details of what he wanted to say and how he wanted to say it. Uh, but breaking out the lines t to where whether it be six lines, six words per line, or five, or whatever, uh, and and the the message also has to be has have a consistency to each line, so it makes sense and it's not uh, part of part of a thought, but hopefully a whole thought per line. But uh, by nature, that it runs on and doesn't have whole thoughts per line, so that had to be considered as well to break it up so that it's as readable as possible and makes sense uh, logically, grammatically, and emotionally at the same time. So all of those things are you know, factors that uh, I consider uh, important to me and make the difference in it being successful. And you don't even know if it's being successful or not. Uh, mm -hmm. I was reading it, and it's there. It's how, if that's how it is. They, they don't think, gee, if they knew you raise that differently, I might have understood it better. You know, that, that doesn't happen. Uh, so uh, much of this is speculated and guesswork and trying to figure the best way 
so that people will follow it, understand, appreciate it, and affect, be affected by it. Uh, Does color uh, come into play uh, in terms of this? Um, I tested, you know, we wound up with yellow, but uh, tested blue, green, orange, um, gray, and uh, it turned out that George liked the yellow best, and, and it turned out to red best as well. Uh, white would be too bright and uh, demand too much of the attention. Um, so the yellow was the proper resolution for it. And uh, it's worked out. You don't see anyone saying, gee, if it was blue, it would look a whole lot better. It, you know, it is what it is. And it's become accepted and, and it's become iconic. And um, it's loved by everyone. <laughs> Nice That's amazing, Dan. I think we're going to. Uh, I think we're going to move on to the next title now. Uh, I think we're going to bring up Nashville and have everyone be able to uh, watch it as we go through it. Um, now, coming from you know, for this particular piece, it's so different from the last one, going from science fiction now to this. It's it's a completely different uh, aspect. Uh, how did the, I think I'll kind of start these all the how did this one come about and then we can kind of get into the title itself and the work on it all right well Nashville uh, from 1975 was a, a very big film it turned out to be quite successful uh, it, its scope alone was so big and wide uh, so many characters and this big canvas and, and white screen and all of music and it was, it was very complex and really packed with information and story and storytelling so um, it had to be really big in every way so um, I studied design at a very prestigious high level school and when Bob Altman asked me to design the titles for the film I started out with a logo and I presented all of these really elegant, powerful, muscular kind of designs, uh, all of which really looked good and worked. And Bob liked them a lot, but thought every one of them was wrong for the film. <laughs> the Nashville is not this elegant, beautiful, graceful, uh, expensive looking place. It's, uh, it's raunchy and dirty and loud and chaotic and confusing. He says, uh, look at the film, and because uh, I jumped on it the minute he came back from location and started designing these things. So, uh, and they were cutting it there, and it wasn't ready even to be looked at at first. So by the time I presented ideas, it was ready to be seen. So he asked me to look at it and, and respond to it. So when I did, I saw that it needed something really raunchy and dirty and loud and confusing and not very well designed. It didn't have to be elegantly, uh, perfectly, uh, exquisitely designed. It needed uh, rawness and coarseness. And so uh, at the time, I used to watch a lot of late night television here in Los Angeles and on the local channels where you could buy airtime for very little money, there were these commercials that were selling record albums and they were compilation albums like all uh, country western, or all um, rock and roll, or all jazz or whatever. They jam all this music into an album and sell it for three or four dollars. And they were hawking these albums on late night television. There was an announcer who would yell and scream uh, stuff about uh, all the artists that were on. And uh, they were flashing words on all the things that I brought to the title sequence for Nashville. Mm -hmm. So I aspired to create this uh, this commercial, which I made exactly 60 seconds, just like a commercial would be on, on television. And I just jammed it with all the music and all the imagery and all the type. And so we had uh, roll-ups and roll-downs, some more famously, and things spinning and curving th through the frame and things flashing on and off. And the announcer um, would yell and scream about the values and the aspects and the qualities of the film 
And every time he'd say Nashville, I'd pop on the word in a different type style each time in a different color and intentionally out of sync. Sometimes it would, he'd say Nashville and it'd come out a second later or a second earlier. So it, it was obviously done by amateurs and that's what I wanted, you know, raw and uh, imperfect. Uh, and I hired the guy who I did all these late night commercials. Uh, Johnny Grant was his name. And I wrote a script and I brought him to a recording studio and we laid down his voice. And then I designed and cut the commercial or the title sequence to his narration. And then we jammed all the music in it that overlaps and so on as well. And it came out this, uh, this maniacal uh, bit of <laughs> uh, filming. Uh, which um, we Bob used it just the way I designed it on the opening of the film, and then Paramount used it uh, as a trail as well. So it worked really well. I'm really yeah, you, you never know. You know, the infomercials uh, of late night television are are influencing you know modern modern cinema as much as they can be, right? Uh, I'm curious. I, I'm curious. I love the thing that you said that you would when you designed the process of it, and you brought it to him, and he said, "I love it, but no, none of them, none of these work." <laughs> how do you how do you go back uh, after you know maybe putting your heart and soul or some of your you know first like initial ideas of something, and, and clearly a great piece came out of it, but you know getting to that piece, how do you uh, how do you get motivated after that when someone says, I love your work, I love it, but absolutely like, doesn't work for this. You know, like, is, yeah. it, is it tough? Well, yeah, that, that's the, uh, the, um, that's the old saying about the kiss kick. You know, you first compliment someone and then you kick them. And you told them. <laughs> I really so complimented all the designs I was showing him and then <laughs> laid down uh, why he didn't think they were right for the movie. Uh, but he's he was wise enough to give me a place to go. And that was to go literally to the editing room and see the film. And if I didn't have that place to go, I might have felt devastated and uh, disappointed about it. And maybe I wouldn't have been able to find something to bring to the film that it needed. Uh, but I, there was so much to see and so much to draw from that ideas were just exploding out of my head. And the obvious one was that it should be a commercial raving about the, yeah, all these films, what they used to get. So when that came, it was very fast. And once Bob, I described it too, he loved it. And I literally went as fast as I could to my studio and started jotting it down. And, because I didn't even speak to myself about it. The idea was so good and so immediate that I had to describe it to him as fast as I could, as soon as I could. Then the uh, Dan, you mentioned you, you mentioned the thing with with Bob Altman that you uh, uh, that he allowed you to see the film, which must really help. And we've actually had other artists as well when designing a poster for it versus a title design. Some of them have seen the film and it helps them influence their design process so much better. I'm just curious how, if you're unable to see the film, how does that uh, influence a title design versus in this case where you're able to have the pleasure of being able to see the film and really get a sense of the, the idea of the, of the movie and its themes? Right. Well, it wasn't unusual that Bob asked me to see the film. Uh, every director that I'm working with mm -hmm. wants me to see the film, not only to share what he's done, or she, uh, but to give me the necessary uh, elements with which to create something from. And that's the same when the director will show the film to his sound effects editor or his composer or um, his... Uh, you know, uh, editing and so on uh, because he needs them to see what's there so they can bring their specialty to it their bit of magic mm -hmm. so I, I'm always showing the film 
But in the case of Nashville, I responded so quickly to Bob asking me to create something that I didn't, and I, it wasn't possible to see the film at that moment. So the few days I took to develop these ideas that I brought to him, they had in the process put the film together well enough that I could see it. So it might have been that Bob saw something in these elegant, uh, high level designs that he liked, and, uh, and then it wouldn't be uh, as necessary to see the film because he would have chosen something that I could then go and put up on the film. Um, but as it worked out, um, it, was, it was best that it worked out that way that I had to see the film too. And I might have then thought, well, these designs do work, these elegant designs. And I would maybe try to convince them to use one of them. Uh, but I, uh, the response that I had was very right from what I saw and what Bob envisioned it for. Uh, as he made the film, he saw a real Nashville that he captured in the film that he wanted to be extended to the title sequence in order to set up the viewer and give him something that. that that was real and that would follow the titles and give them an idea of what to, to expect. No, it's, that's, that's really great, Dan. And it, uh, uh, it, and it, and it, it clearly was successful because the, uh, you know, the, the film title itself is, um, is one that people remember. And, uh, it's interesting to see how, uh, uh, was it how that film, you know, plays in and in, uh, in both, as you mentioned, the, not only the trailer, but then they're using it for different aspects. Uh, it's not just for the title sequence. They're able to adapt it for other pieces, uh, because it is so successful. Yes. Uh, which doesn't often happen. Uh, but they had the wisdom in the Paramount advertising department to see that this element, this piece could be used to promote the film and represent it in other ways as well. And that was good for the film. And I'm always happy when something I do is beneficial in any way it can be. <laughs> so that, uh, that went well. Uh, there's All right. Oh, line. go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, at the very beginning of the film, as most films, is the distributor's logo. And when the Paramount logo came up on the film, uh, you might have noticed that it was in black and white, and it was dirty and scratched and worn and not a, this pristine piece of brand new color film that showed the logo in its all its glory. It was intentionally degraded and beat up and um, <laughs> downright uh, damaged uh, intentionally because uh, Bob came to me during the editing process and the process of showing the film to Paramount and then getting notes on it, he came to me and said, uh, Paramount wants me to short the film a lot so they could have more runnings per day and make more money on it, but they want to take things out that I'm refusing to do. So what can we do to get back at them? We wanted to hurt them back. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought, well, let's release the film with this dirty black and white logo instead of a perfect, clean, pristine piece of new negative. And he loved the idea. So I literally went to the editors and said, I need to borrow that. And they, they had a black and white dupe of the logo on the head of the film that just represented it as a placeholder for where the new logo would go when they were negative cut. A routine with a negative cut would just pull off the shelf a brand new piece of negative of the Paramount logo and cut it in place. So, um, I took that piece of film that had been running back and forth and back and forth, scratched and dirty and so on, and I took it over to my optical effects house and we copied it. Uh, but before we did that, I took it and rolled that up on the floor, and everybody that came into the place walked on it, and, and it got dirty and scratched even more. And then I took it and I cinch wound it on the rewinds to grind all that dirt into the print. And then I had it cleaned. And there was all this damage to it. Uh, so I then had it copied onto brand new colored negatives. And then ultimately it was cut in place. And the day that negative cutting was done, uh, 
a child, we see like oh, it's a negative color I'm with my final product, and I didn't watch the negative. I had to make sure it's done right. So this little woman uh, was cutting negative. So this piece of negative that had to be cut in place to represent the Paramount logo, and it was all scratched up and damaged and so on. And she just like had a heart attack, uh, and she didn't know what to do. And she put it down. So, Supervisor and said, "Look, look, I I didn't do this. But he wants me to cut this in." And I explained patiently that no, this is what we want. This is how it's going to be. So just please cut it in. So oh. I just said, no, "Just do what he says." <laughs> so yeah, and it went that way all over the world. Oh, that is. I I think that's a a great story for people. I would never have known that without that. Um, we're going to move on to the next, uh, the next title, the taxi driver that you had mentioned, uh, that, and, um, now this is, uh, um, I'm curious, was this your first work, uh, with Scorsese? You've done, uh, quite a few films, uh, with Martin Scorsese and, uh, and, uh, yeah, just curious, uh, it was this one the first or, or was, uh, did you, uh, happen to work on another one before this? No, this is the first one, although uh, Marty wanted me to do his previous film, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's when we first met, and he hired me, wanted me to do the film, he said, but I got to get uh, Warner Brothers to approve of it. <clears throat> so he went to uh, the post supervisor, uh, whose name was Rudy Fair, and Rudy was an old-time film editor who had cut many films for Alfred Hitchcock and Otto Preminger and a lot of big names, and now he's supervising all post-production at the um, Warner Brothers. And Marty said he wanted Dan Perry to do his titles, and Rudy said, who's Dan Perry? I don't know who that is. No, you can't have him. So out of that, Marty promised me that I would do his next film, which was Taxi Driver. And he's a very honorable man, so uh, when it came time, he called me and, and I had the job. It wasn't like I was competing or him considering me. I was, I was just getting the job. And then, um, when the time came to view the footage, uh, there was uh, over 200,000 foot of uh, second unit that was shot all over New York City the night and to capture uh, what I called the underbelly of the city. Mm -hmm. so I went through all that footage with Marsha Lucas, who at the time was George Lucas's wife, mm -hmm. and one of the editors on Taxi Driver. And we viewed all this footage together two days, and I started selecting shots, and we started assembling things and finally got a cut of the length that would accommodate all the titles that had to legally be on the opening of the movie. And then I took those backgrounds and started working with them, creating effects and so on, and simultaneously designed the title and the logo and the subsequent titles that were in the main title as well. Um, and shall I go on? There's stories to tell about yeah, I'm curious. I, I I'm curious about the title because it's so specific in terms of like the glowing that comes up for it, and and uh, the particular even the font choice. It's very like it's it's very similar to what looks like an old you know 1970s taxi kind of thing. It's uh, possible to stop on one of these titles. Sure. Yeah. I mean, just stop on one of the titles here. Uh, yeah, you see the the uh, the first names of the names on the end credits. If you go back or forward to one where there's a group of names on the screen, um, and they're drawn from the street signs all over New York City, the signs up on the poles uh, that say the name of the street, uh, where the the cross section uh, with two streets meet, like Second Avenue and Fourteenth Street, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the main sign is for Fourteenth Street, and that's big. And second, the smaller sign for Second Avenue is smaller. So I duplicated the composition of all the street signs in New York City uh, as to how to arrange and present the titles for the title sequence. So I, I went to the city of New York and I asked them, what type style are you using for all your street signs? And they told me. So I got that font and I had all the titles for the entire film set to be exactly like the street signs in the city. And then I placed them high on the screen whenever I could so as to represent the titles of the signs high up on the posts at the corners of the streets. Um, then the main title 
as a dimensional aspect to it, which the other titles don't have. Mm -hmm. and, um, I then put a glow on it that uh, would be likened to uh, the environment in the city at night, and all the neon signs glow against black in the, in the backgrounds. And then all, there's all this smoke coming up out of manhole covers and things. So I, I wanted a lot of that in the sequence, and I wanted it to contaminate the titles. So the titles were within the smoke, not in front of it. So the titles live within the sequence and within the environment that Travis Bickle lives in. Mm -hmm. And so, so they're naturally affected by the environment, and that's the smoke and the cool and the light uh, affects them. So they glow and not glow, come in and out. And then the, the one shot of the POV of Travis looking through the windshield and the rain hitting the windshield, I used a, an effect that was unheard of at the time. It had just been invented um, by an optical effects cameraman, and it was called slit scan. Slit scan. And okay. it was involving uh, re-photographing the title, uh, and, excuse me, background, uh, many times, and when you expose it once, you then expose it a second time, and you slip it one frame. Then the third exposure slipped again. So I did uh, 12 exposures. Uh, each one slipped more and more and more, so it gave a, a streaking, trailing effect that uh, wound up being uh, what Travis is emotionally seeing through his windshield. And that... Uh, affected uh, the viewer to uh, an act of what's coming in the story. And then the last shot is uh, Marty's title, where he always likes his title in red. And mm -hmm. I took the shot and slowed it down by double framing it so that uh, all the characters are walking across the screen, screen across the street, uh, kind of being regarded by the character in the taxi kind of, you know, noticing them in a unique way. So that brings out the personality a bit of the character, so as to, uh, once again, hint at what's coming. So it was all amazing. Cool. And uh, it came gradually as I played with the footage and as I put it together and saw that I could do things to affect the titles and affect the viewer more and to involve them and draw them in and make them part of the story. Oh, incredible. Dan, we're just going to pause there for a second. Um, we're going to get to uh, some other uh, questions from everyone else. It looks like we had like an issue with one of the videos that came, came up, but uh, uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to throw some of the questions in the, uh, uh, that people have been asking throughout this time. Uh, it, we're getting a lot of great ones. Um, I'm curious, uh, uh, we have some people who are filmmakers who are watching the actual um, this uh, stream as well, and and this is a great question. It's uh, as a filmmaker, what should I look for uh, to create the titles of my films? It's such an abstract notion to reflect the mood slash theme of the film with a typeface and a specific design. How do you navigate that? Well, um, to the person that asked this question, I wish I could give you a specific answer. Uh, but since every film is unique and different, uh, every film needs something unique for, for its titles. Uh, hopefully, not just a type style that uh, one would hope captures something about the film that can be conveyed to the viewer, but uh, something that's designed special for it in some way. And that has to come out of um, the film. You, know, you just have to, uh, even if you, it's your own film, you've got to watch it and listen to it and, and then listen to your own response to it and you'll come up upon something that that works that feels right that is organic and and just uh, intuitively is the right way to go uh, there's no answer any more specific than that that i can give you maybe some other person um, would know more about how to do it than i know but i i rely completely on my emotions and my instincts. And it then tells me what it needs. And I've been simply, you know, I'm the conduit 
that uh, whoever comes from comes through me, and I interpret it and apply it and execute it, and then put it on the film. Uh, it's I'm kind curious. Of oh, go ahead, Dan. Same time, it's mysterious. Yeah. And I never know, you know, where it's going to come from. You know, but fortunately, they keep coming. The ideas can just keep coming. Well, it's 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 interesting you mentioned that because a lot of the ideas that you had been talking about, um, when you talked about the three different titles that we've gone through so far, a lot of the inspiration comes from your own personal lived experience. So, for example, like with the Star Wars, you were talking about if you hadn't watched this particular movie, uh, that you wouldn't have gotten that idea for the the to go along the train tracks or in space and the other one would uh in nashville it was the you know the late night you know uh albums of that um to get that idea now do you think that do you ever wonder you know what could have been based on uh certain ideas or what you know it's uh i guess it's always a thing of like do you ever think that maybe that was almost destined to happen and that like it needed you to be there to be in that place to be able to watch that piece at that particular time in order to essentially give the work that you've done? Yeah, that's an interesting question, uh, Mark. Uh, and once again, the, uh, the answer, there is no answer really that, that I can be specific to. Um, I don't think I've ever, you know, wished I'd done something else for a film. Mm -hmm. Every time where I've seen films that I was considered for, but then ultimately not hired to do that I wished I had an idea that would have gotten me the job. Um, but it's, it's always just out of instinct and emotion that, that things come to me. And I, I think that's no different than the, you know, the filmmaker himself or herself when telling their story. They, they might have had an idea that they wrote the script from, but then when they're shooting it, uh, they have plans to do certain things, but when they're at a moment and suddenly uh, the actor moves a certain way or is gesturing something and then the, uh, the artist, the, the director, storyteller gets this idea right on the spot out of the moment and witnessing something that goes on. It's just this, this creative process that uh, we all strive for and, and enjoy being part of that uh, something comes out of it that's wonderful hopefully that uh, we even, even we don't know how it happened then uh, it works and it's used and it's part of the story and, and sometimes it becomes well known and iconic and uh, you know there's endless films that have those qualities uh, from you know turn of the century forward that have these great, wonderful, magical moments that, uh, for the most part, didn't come months before they were, it was done, came from, from the moment while the process is going on, that these things come to it, uh, maybe inevitably, maybe by fate, but it happens. And that's the wonderment and the excitement. And that's why I think all creative people pursue wanting to do that and if they've done it they want to do it again because it's so wonderful to discover these things to find these ideas to execute these terrific things stories and songs and paintings and all those things that come up from nowhere and to a place where they can be appreciated and enjoyed by others it's great i'm so happy i'm part of that you're um do your original ideas, uh, Dan, do they, do they go through a lot of changes? Uh, one of our viewers is asking, uh, it, essentially, uh, before being approved on the movie poster, how many edits do you usually go through, um, you know, once you have that idea, once you, once you are uh, set on that? And I, I guess I would like to add to it, do you find it tough to go back to a filmmaker, especially when you are so passionate about the project as much as they are, and how do you, uh, how do you navigate that, that essential, I guess, storm of, uh, of creativity? Yeah, uh, good word there, Mark, that, that describes it well. Um, it is sometimes a storm. 
Um, for me, I, there's two steps to any design. Um, the first step is the concept or the idea. And then is the execution, the design of that idea that makes it work or not. And sometimes you can have a really great idea. You or I mean anybody who has an idea about something, ping or song or whatever. Uh, so then this concept exists. So then how you choose to execute it can make that idea really successful or just mediocre. And other times there could be a fairly ordinary idea, not particularly great at all, but so well executed, so well designed that it works and is successful. So then obviously the best of those two circumstances is a great idea, really well executed. That's the most successful, that's the perfect combination. And that's what I strive for is a great idea that I can well execute, design it so that it really works and it comes, it gets to be as good as it can be. So yeah. I will then present concepts, ideas. And since they haven't yet been executed or designed, uh, I might go through various stages of development in the process of executing the idea to its finished final form. And along the way, changes might take place. But it's all so organic that it's not like, uh, okay, I've done it this way, and now I'm changing to this one. It's, it's, it's moving in space, and it's, it's, it hasn't stopped yet. So it's on the way to completion. But on the way, we're not really changing it, we're just accomplishing further development, further refined and polished, and uh, along the way to its final form. Um, there have been times, certainly, that I've offered something, a good idea, and the director liked it, and then I go in and design it, and I come up with what I think is the best solution for it, and then present it, and uh, there have been occasions where they thought, well, gee, can't you do this instead, and make that a little darker, or make it faster, or things like that, and uh, sometimes it's a good idea. I think, uh, yeah, that's going to improve it. It's going to make it better, and therefore make the film better. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I might not agree. So I will say, I don't think that is going to work. Or I, I considered that. And I didn't think it was best to do it that way instead of this way. Uh, so then it becomes a, uh, a discussion that we wind up settling on what the, ultimately the director feels is best. I mean, he's the boss or she. Uh, and, and I'm in service to him or her, and that film. I want what's best for the film. And if it turns out to be his version of something, that's what's best for the film. And that's what I'll do. Mm -hmm. So I'm a professional, and I, I've been hired to do something. Uh, I'm serving the film. Uh, it's not my, about my ego or what I want. It's what, what the film needs. And I try to listen to myself and listen to the filmmaker and listen to the film. So I can uh, get a clue on what's best, what it needs. So tell me, tell me, Dan, who is who is the toughest uh, client you've ever had, and why is it Martin Scorsese? <laughs> why is it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know if he actually would be the hardest, the, the well, toughest client you've ever had. But uh, with Marty, uh, he's so collaborative and he's so wise uh, to know that. Uh, the person you've hired to do whatever they want to do on the film, you just let them go, let them do it. I mean, mm -hmm. you've chosen them out of other things they've done. And so you want that for your film as well. And, and if you've chosen them to do what they've done before, then let them do it rather than tell them what to do and guide them and control them. Uh, that's part of Marty's wisdom and skill as a filmmaker is choosing the right people and then let them do it. Uh, a lot of filmmakers are not like that. They mm -hmm. control it for you what they want you to do. Um, fortunately, I'm, I'm often told by filmmakers that I hire you because you're the, you're the master. You're the one that can do the best for my film. Uh, I don't know how to do what you do. 
So I want you to do it, and I want you to do what you think is best. Um, so then they're, all, they're predisposed then to accept what you're going to do for them because they love what you've done on other films, and they're confident, and they believe in your ability to do what's best for their film. And I do my best work with directors like that. Uh, to be more specific, uh, who's the toughest, uh, most difficult that I've worked with, uh, it would have to be, though I actually never did the film, it was uh, on True Lies with uh, Jim Cameron, who mm -hmm. was a, a task, task master, and he, uh, his way is just to beat everybody up until they submit to him. And then he beats them again, even after they've submitted. Um, he's a good filmmaker, but his process... Uh, whereby he gets good film from his people uh, is just not <laughs> my way. Uh, not your way of working. <laughs> under those circumstances. Uh, the day I met him and presented ideas on True Lies, uh, which were really good ideas, and they really served the film, uh, but fortunately for me, he rejected them. So I didn't get the job, which I was very glad about. <laughs> About him. He's, a, he's, a, he's a good guy. He's just a uh, taskmaster and difficult in his process. Mm -hmm. I guess everyone is different, right? The way they work. Um, yeah. We're just getting to the last, the last couple questions here from uh, people online. Dan, um, I get a lot of the questions we're getting is, uh, you know, I guess the, in terms of the filmmaking process of what you went in towards uh, in the past, uh, do you find that like the modern filmmaking uh, versus say the, I would say it's almost a do it yourself filmmaking of like the 1970s, which kind of uh, spurred so many of these famous directors. Uh, do you find it different now or a lot? Uh, the creative process is different just based on people who are, who are actually basing their work on the people that you have worked with over your career. Right. Yes, well, they've, they've learned all about the different filmmaking styles and the technology and the technique of things uh, as it stands now with uh, cameras being so detailed and uh, able to capture the subtleties of, of a shot much more effectively than film cameras from years ago. But it still requires a vision, uh, you know, a viewpoint, uh, an idea, a notion, you know, to put a story together. Uh, so filmmakers today are very facile at uh, using the equipment and putting their images onto the digital frame. Um, but just like it was years ago, some of them are very good storytellers. And some are serviceable and some are really outstanding. But that's no different than always has been. Mm -hmm. They can use the tools better, I think, than filmmakers from years ago. Because it was more difficult to shoot film. Mm -hmm. to it. But equipment was cumbersome, heavy, and difficult. Where all that's not with us anymore. Uh, but it's still, you had to have a, a way to tell the story, to get that idea on film or in a way that you can present it and entertain others. So Amazing. Yeah. Working with those filmmakers uh, requires a certain amount of adjustment sometimes if I see that the filmmaker is not very experienced and doesn't seem to know what they want with their film. Uh, they, Filmmakers never know what they want, but they often know what they don't want. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to for that, stick your neck out, and take chances offering things uh, that you think are right and good for the film, not knowing whether they hate red titles or hate uh, something that you're going to offer. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no way of knowing. So it's, uh, it's an adventure all the time. Dan, I, uh, I think we're, uh, we're about to wrap this up here, but I wanted to kind of come back to the book one last time and have everyone look at it. And I'm just curious, uh, you know, 
once you wrote it uh, and you had everything down, if you could like you know have one thing that you would want people to take away from your book, uh, what would it be? You know, what would you, you know, if you could hand this to someone and say, I want you to look at this and what would that, what would that one thing be that you would want people to take away from this? Well, since these films in the book are represented by the logos I've designed for them, um, I think it's, I would want them to see that every film is different and therefore every design is different. And there's room for all those ideas and all those designs and all those films uh, within our purview and uh, that we can appreciate many kinds of things. Um, that's kind of an obtuse message, but in that it's, uh, it certainly is not something that I've, I've come to think, uh, this is what I want uh, readers of my book to to think and feel and know. Uh, it's not like that. Uh, it's kind of a, a summation of the work I've done so that uh, people can benefit by it, that can enjoy it, can learn from it, and can know about what I went through to do it. Uh, once again, sharing it as it happened. As it well, you certainly have... You certainly have shared uh, incredible stories with us today, and we are incredibly grateful, and I'm sure all the people watching online right now are incredibly grateful for everything you've told us, uh, especially the one of jumping and stamping on a logo to get back at the studio. I think that is probably my uh, my favorite uh, my favorite story so far today. Like, if I... If I have to, uh, unfortunately, we can't do that for film now. You'd have to step on a hard drive, and it would just, uh, it would just destroy yeah. the picture. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, the last few projects, I've been asked by uh, the filmmakers who have sometimes shot their film on film, but they're of course finishing digitally. Uh, but I've been asked to uh, execute the titles on film rather than digitally. Uh, more and more often because they like so much what I've done on film. And, uh, and it's a, a different effect than what done digitally. So it, it's interesting that they're, they're harking back to the old days of mm -hmm. show on film. Even though films are still called films now, that are not on film, and never were on film, mm -hmm. uh, or called films. <laughs> so it's amusing that, uh, that it's so valuable and so unique um, when a film is on film that modern filmmakers sometimes want their films to be on film or at least if nothing else have the titles be on the film mm -hmm. so they have to execute them on film instead of digitally which is a, a big uh, problem to do because uh, the film equipment and film technicians are not really around anymore well, coming from a filmmaker's perspective, I remember 10 years ago of delivering film negative to Technicolor and how far it's come today. So it is, uh, it is quite a difference with everything now, but you're absolutely right. It's, um, it's, it's just a, it's a completely different experience. Yeah, true. Uh, I think it's coming back to some extent. It'll never replace digital, but it might be side by side. There might be 20% of films shot and, and finished on film and the movie will be digital. But still, uh, the digital pro way of presenting films won't change. I don't think we'll go back to maybe here and there a, a film presentation where a digital film was put on film so it could be shown uh, to, the, to purists who see on film. That might be sporadic success where uh, films will be presented on a digital format from here on, I think. From here on out. Well, Dan, thank you so much today for being here. It's been a pleasure. Um, we can uh, tell everyone to pick up Dan's book. Trust me, it is an incredible piece of work, and anyone who is a film lover will not disappoint with this. Uh, Dan, where can they find it? At danperry.com, correct? danperry.com, yeah.
Amazing. And where can uh, people find you or follow you uh, on social media? Uh, what do, what is the best place to look for you? Instagram. Um, if you were to go to damper.com, you could get to the Instagram posts that I've been doing as well. Uh, I think there's also dan.perry that is on Instagram as well. Or Incredible. At- well, I encourage everyone to go follow your Instagram and go pick up Me your too. book. Uh, I uh, I certainly have. Uh, if if it wasn't for all of us at Layer Butter getting buying this, then I would. Ha- <laughs> I, I know there's more people that we could definitely uh, we could definitely sell this to that would absolutely enjoy it. And uh, and finally, uh, just for us, uh, if you're interested, once again, we are Layered Butter, a community dedicated to the art and inspired by film. Uh, through essays, interviews, and artwork, and our mission is to celebrate and champion what we love about the movies. Um, if you're interested in learning more about us or supporting our work, we invite you to head over to layerbutter.com and check out our issues, and you can also f- further support us becoming a Patreon member at layerbut- patreon.com slash layerbutter, or check out our weekly podcast uh, every Sunday. Just search for Layer Butter on all of your regular places that you find them. Thank you, everyone. Dan, once again, uh, I hope you have a good evening. And I think everyone, I can speak for everyone saying that uh, uh, that you uh, did an incredible job today and we're, we're, we're ever better for it. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. I really enjoyed it. Oh, last sets. Oh, one last thing. Uh, we're going to announce the contest winner. We are giving away one of your books, okay. and uh, Elisa Ortiz has won the contest. Uh, one of our, uh, uh, she is, uh, she is on the stream, I believe, right now, but uh, watching. But Elisa Ortiz, congratulations! You have won uh, this incredible book. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, you will absolutely enjoy it. So amazing! Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Dan. I really appreciate it, and uh, I hope you have a good evening. Okay. Bye-bye.